This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Sarah Talia. Our growing reliance on mobile phones, the internet and social media may be changing how our brains work and altering our ability to focus. Early research expressed concern about the impacts of screen use on concentration and mental health, particularly in children. However, newer research finds that many of the early conclusions regarding the negative effects of screen time and social media may have been overstated. In this episode, I was joined by two researchers from Curtin School of Population Health, Dr. Patrick Clark and Tamsin Mulhilligam. We chatted about how cognitive processes are changing in response to technology, the connections between inattention and health, and how future technologies could impact brain function. If you'd like to find out more about this research, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Patrick, can you explain what attention control is and how it's actually measured? Yeah, so it's um, it's a bit of a big umbrella term and there's a few processes that we, we kind of readily recognise in there. So there's sort of, and, and bits you'll probably be able to relate to quite readily too. So there's uh, a really big one that's important and it, it comes back to this idea that I guess is becoming um, more prominent, this idea of free won't rather than free will. So this idea that so much of what we actually do is just inhibiting the vast array of other things that are going on in the world at a given point in time. Because when we're attending to one thing at the moment, you know, listening to a voice or anything else, there is so much stimuli hitting us, you know, the clothes on our body, the sounds elsewhere. So we're inhibiting all the rest of that to focus on a really, really small slice of what's going on. So, um, when we get like a break in that, you hear your voice heard or something, that's a sort of a lapse in the inhibition because it's reached a threshold that you have to direct your attention somewhere else to grab something. So that's one, just one part, inhibition. Um, there's also switching. So being able to switch between different tasks or different things that we kind of look at in the environment as well. Um, so, you know, um, switching between verbal and um, audiovisual tasks is one thing. Um, you know, you can juggle and speak at the same time, but um, you know, doing two tasks that are quite heavy on you know verbal linguistic skills. You know how we, you know, counting days of the week as you go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you can't do those two tasks quite as easily at the, at the same time. And then the other third kind of major class of it is this idea of. They, they call it updating, but it's generally holding stuff in mind at a given point in time. Because at any given time, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're formulating what we're doing next. We're thinking about um, the context we're in. And we might be, you know, uh, if we're figuring something out, we're holding the nature of a problem in the mind. We're adding new information into it. We're manipulating those things. So this is kind of things that relate to working memory, but, you know, general updating system. So, yeah, these are, those are, you know, there's other slightly different conceptualizations, but those sort of three things of, you know, inhib inhibition and inhibitory control, switching and um, yeah, updating processes are generally regarded as the three big classes of attention control. And obviously those different uh, uh, ways that our brain is working and capturing, holding and retaining or not um, are, well, it's not so obvious actually at the moment how they may or may not be changing. In what ways could the digital world be changing uh, attention spans, control, um, holding, that type of thing? Look, in principle, in a lot of different ways, and um, I guess that's been some of the work that we've been looking at a little bit um, recently, but one of, the, one of the things about brains, and I remember in one of my um, you know, earlier employments, uh, there was a, someone who does a lot of work in the neural space and them commenting on one of the amazing things is that anything stays constant in the brain because there's so much going on. Like We used to think of brains being very static and set, but the amount of plasticity and adaptability of, of processes in the brain is absolutely huge. So we know brains change very constantly and they change with the tasks that we give them. So the more we practice certain sorts of skills or, or anything else, our brains will adapt to those things. Which is why when we're thinking about, you know, what tasks we're giving our brains repeatedly in terms of what we're serving up and perhaps via digital media and the like, it's really interesting to be thinking about how that could be training certain sort of neural habits and patterns that might have flow on effects through other areas of life as well. 
How long do you think that that change has been underway? Since ever? Or it's not since smartphones just kind of hit our hands? No, well, it's really, it's, it's interesting. I mean, probably yes, forever. And I mean, coming back to this idea of, you know, human beings running this modern 21st century software on what's essentially Stone Age hardware. You know, we, we haven't updated our neural systems fundamentally since we stood upright and started walking across the world from Africa. So, um, yeah, human beings have this remarkable adaptability in our neural capacities, and that has been going on forever over time. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's a really interesting balance between being legitimately concerned about some of the, the, the pressures we're placing on ourselves or some of the habits that, that we're creating, but also reminding ourselves that every time a new technology has come along, people have predicted that this is going to be the, you know, the youth of today are about to experience their, their most tremendous and awful downfall because of television or radio or whatever else it was that sort of came along at the time. So I think it's important to be kind of you know, concerned and aware of some of those things, but also to... Um, temper that with you know, a healthy scepticism as well. well. Let's come back round to that. But in the meantime, Tamsin, you've done extensive research in distractibility, social media and mental health. What connections has your research uncovered? So what we found is that people with sort of poor attention control, so who sort of struggle to sustain their attention over a period of time on like a focused task, tend to have a stronger relationship with the amount of social media they use and also psychological distress. So that's things like depression and anxiety, just sort of, if we think of like mental well-being, it's sort of mental ill health. Um, and so we find in people who have poor attention control and uh, probably more distractible, they my, when they use more social media, they tend to show higher levels of psychological distress, whereas people who are better at directing their attention, focusing their attention, don't show that same strong relationship. So they might use the same amount of social media, but they might not have that same level of psychological distress. Right. Can you just tell us as well how, tell us about the study, who was involved and how did it actually work? Yeah. So this sort of initial study with attention control and psychological distress was done in 2020, so around COVID. And it was at Curtin with mostly undergraduate students as participants. And basically what we got them to do is they came in, they... Um, we checked how much social media they had used the week before, and then they did a test for depression, anxiety, psychological distress, and then they did an attention control task. So that's a computer-based task where it sort of tests how good you are at directing your attention. And then what we did is, well, half of them, they just kept using social media as they usually would. And then the other half, we got them to stop using social media for a week. And then what we did is we brought them all back a week later, and then they did all the same things again. And what we found is in that initial session at baseline, that finding with the attention control and social media. So what does that tell you about how we can minimise those psychological risks? Is it a matter of just no social media if you're struggling in that area or reduce it, what's the best approach there? I think it's not so much about how much social media you're using. So it's not oh, all social media is bad. It's more about looking at how we're using it, the types of use, how aware of the social media we're engaging with. So, you know, more focused social media use where, you know, I'm going on Facebook to check in on my friends and I'll spend five minutes is probably good. Whereas opposed to like, oh, I'll spend five minutes on TikTok and then it's two hours and you've been scrolling, it's probably less good. So how are there some practical ways, I'm sorry, question without notice, <laughs> that you can do that? Because I know sometimes I'll have the intention of going, I'm going to spend five minutes just scrolling mm -hmm. through my feed and then 45 minutes later I'm going, oh my God, how did that happen? I just went down this complete rabbit hole. Which is pretty common, especially because of how the algorithms are designed. They want you to stay on the apps and the platforms. And what, like another recent finding we've had is people are really bad 
at guessing how much social media they use, so they really struggle to estimate that. There are tools like built into your phone and stuff. So like iPhones and I think all Android phones are having that built into settings as like well-being or screen time. And what you can do is you can actually like objectively check how much you've used. And you can also put in screen time limits for your app. So if you're like, I don't want to use more than two hours of Facebook a day, you can like put a limit in. But even just sort of checking at the end of the day and being more aware of how much you're consuming will help with your judgment of how much you've used each day. Oh, it's a word that gets bandied around a lot, but consciously kind of approaching it really. Yeah. I know that I've only, I can pick up my phone in the morning, jump straight onto social media and go, whoa, whoa, there's 15 minutes right there. I've kicked, and then I'm beating myself up because I'm like, you've started off the day on social media. Yeah. So really actually taking a pause before you fall into those routines. Yeah. Less, less of just checking as a habit and more of what, am, what is my goal with this? And I guess in that same way, you know, that idea of having a goal and, and coming back to it, it's not all bad. And I think some of the things that we've been a bit interested with now and perhaps looking into further in future research is the idea that social media is not a single thing necessarily. And as we've sort of alluded to, there's this world of difference between engaging with friends in a bit of banter on, you know, different platforms and exchanging memes or, um, you know, watching hilarious animal videos and, you know, doom scrolling all the horrific things that are happening in the world, um, you know, for ages on (laughs) Twitter or another platform. So you can get these huge levels of variance in the, you know, um, how social media is used. And you can obviously see from those stark examples how that could be shaped. And I guess the flip side of that is, well, it's sort of, so what patterns of use might be problematic, but also for who? So, you know, um, some people might be very resilient to being exposed to certain types of content, but then, you know, young adolescents who are very sensitive about their bodies, you know, following um, lots of Instagram influences can have, you know, potentially negative effects with those things as well. So both that sort of you know, who might be vulnerable. And I guess that's what we've focused a bit on with the research in relation to attention and the like, Um, but also what patterns of use might be particularly problematic too. I'd love to know a little, maybe this is an overly personal question, but how do you both manage your social media use? (laughs) Um, So it's a bit of, I feel like I'm on track and a bit of do as I say and not as I do. So I've had to sort of actively go and go, look, I'm not going to download TikTok, but, um, you know, I didn't have Facebook until after I finished high school. So I don't have that real habitual connection with Facebook. But the one that really gets me is Instagram. And so like everything else I'm really good about and Instagram, like sometimes I'm like, oh, I've spent my 45 minutes for today. Maybe I'll spend another 45. That's deeply reassuring. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Patrick? Yeah, look, I, um, I guess in the same way, I've managed to stay off some platforms just by not taking that step. Although, you know, there is occasional things where I'll actually, you know, look at my wife's feet (laughs) on something just to see how it's going. But um, no, look, I, I think in particular, I guess I'm a bit aware of a lot of that short form video content, like um, Facebook's putting up, you know, Facebook shorts and then, well, or um, reels and then there's YouTube shorts. I haven't got TikTok, but because that is exclusively that medium, already through those other platforms, it's really, really Moorish, you know, and I feel like that analogy of, you know, you've got the, the huge bowl of tasty treats in there, but they're really, really small and you're only just having one more the whole time. And before you, you, before you know it, you've eaten half, half the bowl. So in, in the same way, I think there is that tendency for people to perhaps lose track of time a little bit more when engaging because each one's only really, really small and you can just flick through it. So I think I'm, you know, um, cautious about how that could be shaping attention a little bit sometimes, which is why I try to stay away from it. And I'm, I'm, you know, usually pretty strict with my kids about that too. (laughs) Yeah. Did it come through in the research at all, Tamsin, that uh, there a generational difference between impact in this space? Um, We haven't found one yet based on the stuff that we've run, but, you know, even looking at some of the apps, you can see like, you know, some people will either, who have TikTok will either have, really, really high TikTok use, or like some people only have like the tiniest bit, like a few minutes in a week. And so it's really interesting to sort of start seeing patterns of, 
you know, oh, TikTok is always quite high or Instagram is always quite high and those sort of patterns start coming out. And Patrick, uh, while we're talking about the impact um, that uh, this use is having and how we can manage it, are we able to rebuild our attention spans or our attention control? Oh, yeah. Look, um, there's a lot of things people can do in their daily lives. And it's, it's really interesting to reflect on the things that we, in some ways, have gotten better at as well. Because, I mean, you've probably had that experience yourself of being able to handle a lot of complexity and switching between multiple demands and tasks at a given point in time. And we've gotten quite good at essentially switching from one thing to another thing to another thing. What we're perhaps less good at is retaining focus for a long period of time on a single task that might might be a bit arduous and a bit harder work without going, oh, there's, there's this other little thing that I need to get to. And there, there are, I mean, again, it's about kind of that, that brain training. And obviously, um, you know, there are techniques that people use, and particularly with mindful focus type tasks and the like, that when people practice those things really, really regularly, there is evidence that you can increase that sustained focus. I guess the, the kind of potential interest and concern, and again, this is, it's really early days for some of these things because some of these platforms, while they're talked about in ways, you know, we talk about them a lot, they're really, really new. It's only a year or two old and on much of the, the research takes at least a year or more before it's actually coming out. So a lot of it we don't know about, but I guess the concern is that any kind of brain training we might be doing ourselves to be, you know, more focused has to potentially combat this training we're doing incidentally on our devices that's telling us to no, only only pay attention for really short durations and give us really small hits of positive you know brain sugar in some ways as well so yeah are there any while there are so many unknowns floating around are there any kind of standard go-to brain training um, approaches techniques programs that you would recommend Oh, look, there are, I mean, a lot of, you know, good organizations that are releasing mindfulness-based apps now for free, and they have really, really good programs. And I think, um, you know, for some people in some situations, it isn't always something that is necessarily helpful. You know, there's evidence that people who have experienced trauma and the like don't find it particularly useful. But just in terms of everyday um, regular pattern, providing your brain with a bit of latent downtime in which you can actually, you know, um, have that bit of regular focus is not a bad thing to be doing at all. Um, and I guess, I mean, we are, we also just talk about other just generally good habits, you know, the, the whole just, just going to watch a couple little videos while I'm brushing my teeth or something, which kind of means that your the amount of sleep you're getting can be pushed out and these sorts of things as well. So just observing good habits with, um, yeah, the, uh, the types of device usage that you're engaging in as well. I can see you nodding away, Tamsin. Is there any other points, um, there any other techniques that you use that I help? think, well, I don't always use this, but especially another thing that's coming out in the research is multi-screening. So not just going from one thing on an app to another, but looking at Facebook or watching a YouTube video or having Instagram open on your phone and then Facebook open on your computer. So your brain is splitting its attention between two things. And there's not a lot of research on that in the social media space. But if you're doing that a lot, logically, it doesn't make sense that it's necessarily the most healthy thing for your brain to be able to focus on one task or sustain attention. So even just in a day, just trying to do one activity at a time can be really helpful. And I think on that too, just that being present in it. So I think when we talk about mindful tasks, we think about setting time aside, just to focus on our breathing and all these other things, but just practicing being very present when we're doing single tasks. And like you say, the idea that we can be watching a show on Netflix and then we're in, in a spot that's a bit boring. So we start scrolling on our phones and all of a sudden our attention is divided again. So even just, you know, fairly menial tasks, if we can kind of just you know, retain focus on that in a, in a bit of a present and mindful way, those things can kind of combat that, you know, yeah, divided, split attention habits a bit too. I'm going to throw this out to either or um, of you. How do you see our brains, with all that in mind, um, adapting to the intense digital demands in the future, like VR and the internet of everything? What do you think about movement that could happen in that space? It's interesting. I mean, I guess we're we're yet to see from uh, Zuck what exactly the, <laughs> the the Internet of Everything might actually look like. But um, 
You know, in some ways, from little experiences I've had with VR, it's incredibly immersive. And to the extent that those environments will be able to, you know, draw people in in a large way, obviously that comes with its with its risks, but also it can be hugely entertaining um, and interesting way to, to connect. You know, there's, I guess, a few examples of things recently where, you know, over COVID, when conferences and the like were completely shut down internationally and everything migrated to online, it felt like a not entirely... Um, you know, replicated experience when you're meeting with people um, face-to-face online. But to the extent that something like that could be replicated in a more realistic virtual environment, then all of a sudden we're reducing our emissions by not flying to, you know, faraway places and the like. So you could see some really um, substantial potential advantages with some of those things. Uh, But yeah, in terms of, I guess, how our brains will adapt to some of them, it's, it's really a suck it and see. You know, we're still so early along this process. We... We kind of know many of the fundamentals that can help us to be, you know, create good habits in the long term to the extent that um, we can use some of those online environments to help encourage those things that could be very good. But we are, you know, while we often know what's good to us, we are often um, quite at the whims of what we like as well, (laughs) even though we know that they're not fantastic. So to the extent that we can be seduced by some of those things, it might be a bit risky sometimes too. Yeah. And I think also in the VR space, while there's a lot of unknowns, there's some research coming out about therapy via VR being really effective in some circumstances. So in the ways that it could be used for good, you know, people in remote communities might have access to support that they might not otherwise have. That can be really beneficial. But I guess when we're thinking about social media and like the capitalization of like the internet and things like that, we're kind of at the mercy of like companies and what's going to make them money as opposed to what might be the most well-being focused ways of using these sort of resources. And I guess that's the really interesting point. You know, when we talk about the algorithms and the way in which they're designed, they're designed to maximise engagement. And that's where you saw some of the controversy about how Facebook has been, you know, almost spinning hatred into cash in some ways by feeding people selectively, um, you know, content that they that might actually get them very angry and irate because it yeah, um, promotes greater engagement. And um Obviously, algorithms could, in principle, be designed to make people feel very good about themselves, but to the but that might not then make them use those products as much. So that the incentive isn't necessarily there for large corporations to to sort of do that, which is why I guess um, there is that in potential role for kind of regulation with these things. And obviously, it's really hard for governments to keep up given how fast that space moves. Mm. And especially with things like parasocial relationships like companies making twitter accounts where they're like acting like people and you're like engaging with them and you're seeing you know the thing with twitter and how it was bought out and then you could buy verification and then people were sort of making fake company accounts and then companies were getting in trouble because people were like oh why is this company so dodgy you know things like that are still quite new and we haven't really figured out how to navigate them yet Well, it's interesting to bring out the crystal ball for a minute. We're going to pause for a quick ad break. We'll be back uh, right after this ad. Are you interested in a research degree? At Curtin University, we'll help you build knowledge in your profession and turn your discoveries into real world outcomes. You'll benefit from resources and support across areas like agriculture and environment, defence and healthy communities. Our commitment to innovative research has seen 95% of our assessed research areas rank at or above world standard in the latest Excellence in Research Australia results. Learn how your research could make an impact at curtain.edu forward slash research. And we're back. Okay, we learnt a bit about attention spans and some of the connections between attention control and mental health and what may be evolving in this space in the future. I'd love to learn a little bit more about both of you. Uh, Patrick, can you tell me about your research journey so far and your plans for some of the upcoming projects? Yeah, sure. So I guess the way that I've kind of worked my way to, you know, a a bit of a focus on social media as being part of my research program has been uh, 
through my, my, the focus of my PhD and quite a bit of my other early work has been on um, the kind of patterns of cognition, thinking, but also the way in which people process their environment. So, you know, you might have had that experience of um, certain sights or sounds capturing your attention more readily in the environment. I always think a classic example is, you know, when you're thinking or, or you've just bought a new car or something like that, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere, you know. So sometimes certain things become more salient to us as a result of experiences. And that can be the case also with um, emotion problems as well. So when people are having difficulty, say, with anxiety or depression, sometimes more negative content tends to leap out of the background at them a bit as well. So a lot of my past research was looking at how um, the way in which people to attend or interpret information in their environment might shape their emotional uh, experience a bit. And that kind of dovetailed. I, I did my clinical training and, um, in psychology and worked quite a bit with um, youth mental health as well and then sort of came back into the teaching and research area again, a bit from there. But it, it didn't feel like a huge leap from thinking about the way in which our brains might be shaped by our environment and the cognitive processes to then thinking about, well, we're seeing a lot of our world these days through digital content, you know? And so the way in which people might be interacting with our devices could be a pretty powerful force in shaping how we feel about the world and these sorts of things as well. So I guess that is sort of how I've come to being a bit interested in um, yeah, people's interactions with social media and their devices more broadly. And Tamsin, I understand you're undertaking a research project exploring the effects of social media on the mental health of LGBTQIA plus people. Can you tell us more about this project and how people can actually get involved? Yeah, so the project is looking at how social media affects queer people. And that's because we found that minorities are increasingly sort of looking to social media as a form of social support and community connection, but it can also really sort of expose you to sort of risk factors for mental health. You know, a really clear example is during, you know, the postal plebiscite around marriage equality, where there was a lot of community support and engagement, but at the same time, there was a lot of debates and, you know, quite critical sort of content going on on social media. And that sort of taking that sort of stuff in is not really the best for your mental health. So that's obviously a very focused example, but on a broader scale, it's sort of happening every day to an extent. And we don't really know to what extent social media for these communities is helpful or is having a negative effect or if it sort of evens out. So the research is sort of focused on testing that um, and really sort of figuring out the ways we're using social media and how it might be used more helpfully for these communities rather than or more so avoiding these sort of harmful effects. Um, and I guess you can get involved by sending an email through or on Twitter, social media again. Um, yeah. And we periodically advertise for participants in studies as well. So yeah, yeah. people can be on the lookout for some of that too. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those fantastic examples, I say fantastic examples, stark examples perhaps of um, how social media use can be both a fantastic force for some really fantastic connection between people where you know, people through their own peer groups might not have been able to connect to a much larger community of individuals who they're able to, you know, um, relate to and feel welcomed by and validated by in some ways. But at the same time, engaging in that online environment where so much kind of nastiness can be thrown around sometimes does increase vulnerability in some ways to being exposed to, you know, some very um, nasty and judgmental opinions sometimes too. When are you hoping to kick off that research? So it's ongoing now and it's probably going to be ongoing for another year or so, six months to a year. So yeah, whenever. So if people are listening to this podcast right now and going, you know what, that's me, I'd love to get involved. Now's the time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Tamsin and Patrick, for coming in today and walking us through your, your world and some of the connections between our mind and our screens. No worries. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. 
You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And don't forget to subscribe to The Future Of on your favourite podcast app. Bye for now.